So, uh, to move things along, I want to introduce our, our welcoming speaker, Dr. Laurel Meadows, Dean of the Pavlis Honors College. And uh, I, I printed off her resume, and it's, it's far too long to really do it uh, justice, but after a distinguished career in marine and ocean science, uh, Dr. Meadows served as Assistant Dean of Academic Programs at University of Michigan. Uh, she's done work in service learning. She's going to tell us about some of her latest research, actually, which will be really interesting. Uh, culturally contextualized design. So um, I'll, I'll let her take it over. Thanks. Um, index cards, and I'm going to just hand these out, and I'd like you each to take one because we'll, um, we'll be using these somewhere in the process of my talk. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, this is a passion of mine, and I don't often have the opportunity to um, work in this area as I'm beginning to create a, a new honors college here. So, so it's fun to kind of get back to my roots. So as Dave mentioned, I'm from the University of Michigan. I came here about just over a year ago. But when I was at University of Michigan, I started a couple of um, service learning programs, one for first-year students in engineering, where we worked with community partners in Ypsilanti and in Detroit, and then a second one for um, juniors and seniors that was a year-long program called Engaged Urban Design, where we also worked with community partners in Detroit and Ypsilanti. Actually, those were just in Detroit. Um, I learned a lot going through the process of being an engineer, stepping into the realm of community service and, and the community service learning piece. And so I wanted to share a little bit of what I learned on that pathway, but also talk to you about some research that we've been doing, thinking about what it is that students actually gain from engaging in this kind of environment and how we might do a better job of informing instructors and um, students about what it is they can get in these environments and what kind of environments provide the greatest gain. So um, we'll just dive in with that. So when we talk about culturally contextualized design, what we're talking about is the intersection between intercultural maturity and contextual design. And intercultural maturity is, on this campus, is something that I think you might have been heard referred to as um, global literacy. It's, it's that idea that you've gained experience and, um, and knowledge in working with others from different backgrounds, from different cultures. I like the intercultural maturity because I think that when we talk about global literacy, we're thinking about international experience, and intercultural maturity really helps us see that this is also valuable in a domestic context, which is where I did most of my work. Um, contextual design is when you design in context, in an environment, in a place, in a location, in a community. And so when you put those two things together and look at that intersection, we, um, we, we coined the phrase culturally contextualized design so that we could know, kind of know what we're talking about. So the key questions that we had related to this are what are the skills, competencies, and experiences that enable this kind of design? And for each aspect that we come up with of that process, what levels of sophistication are evident in our students? Well, this is acting kind of funny. So we engineered, we're, sorry, we interviewed 35 engineering students who had been engaged in design either domestically or internationally in a variety of contexts. In some cases, they had been in um, very short immersions and very short programs, maybe a week working on a project for a semester. In other situations, they worked for a year on a project and were embedded for several months or for, for maybe six to eight weeks in a context. So we had a variety of different kinds of organizations. And these are the kinds of questions that we asked the students. This first set of questions, this is just examples, is thinking back to intercultural experiences and what it felt like to experience that. The second set of questions were about the design process. So we separated out the intercultural maturity and the design in mean context, the contextualized design. <coughs> and then we asked students to reflect <laughs> on the intersection between those. And in some cases, students didn't really see that intersection, and in some cases, they did. 
So before I go on to do anything else here, what I'd like you to do is grab out, since I gave you a card, you probably figured you need to bring it into the implement. <laughs> so pull that out, and what I'd like you to do before we start, and I explain kind of what we found, which probably won't be too surprising to you. Um, on that card, just quickly write down what was your motivation to engage in the type of design experience that you've been engaged in or plan to engage in if you haven't started yet. I think just quickly and quietly about that motivation and get it jotted down on the card. Are things that are not particularly surprising or um, earth shattering. It's um, things that we that we all I think encounter. What we're really trying to do, though, is provide a framework through which, as educators, we can go in and decide and, and determine, are these things being achieved by our students? And if they're not, maybe we should adjust the way that we're approaching our, our instruction or our framework around which we offer these kinds of, ex of um, experiences. So these are the, as we interviewed students, we coded all, the, all of the data and um, we looked for themes. And what we found were five themes that kept coming up from students um, that represent what students are when they're engaged in this context. So students are human oriented, they're collaborative, they're open to flexibility and ambiguity, they are intentional, and they're socially responsible. But there are all of these things to varying degrees depends on their, depending on the type of experience they had and the amount of experience that they've had. And so we, we also um, provide three different developmental kind of levels of sophistication, if you will, from being the novice to being aware, all the way up to being an informed designer. And so I want to share each of these and talk a little bit more about what do they mean. So, and, and I also want to share some quotes from students to help maybe solidify what it is we're, we're really talking about. So when we talk about human-oriented, this is fusing the idea of a human-centered design process with a deeper understanding of the cultural and social context. Are you all familiar with human-centered design? I see lots of nodding heads. So um, can somebody explain what human-centered design is? All those nodding heads stop nodding. <laughs> it's OK. We're all friends here. What's, what's human-centered design? How do you approach that? Yes? That you, if you're looking to do a project for a community, you go to that community and look to see if they actually need that project. Okay. And, you know, do some research about, you know, the different things that they have there, the natural resources that you can use, and then also if the people actually really want this project to be built there. Okay. So that's a very mature approach, <laughs> highly sophisticated approach to human-oriented design that you've mm -hmm. described. So when we um, look at human-centered design, what we're really talking about then is centering the design process on what humans need or, um, or even what it is that, that their experience is so that you can gain perspective from the individuals for whom you're designing. And um, when, when I was teaching this in, in, uh, in the last few years, we were calling it community-centered design because we were really interested in that community context. And so you're not just looking at, at the, the design process. In this case, when you go to the human, take the step to be human oriented, you're also looking at the experience of the, of the individuals with whom you're designing. And you're looking at their cultural and social context. And so here's a quote from one of the students that we interviewed. Another thing that's huge in Nicaragua in particular was the history of revolution and historical political stuff. Can you tell this is a direct quote, right? Stop. Yeah. Talking with the people, it came up in daily conversation all the time and the impact of that in their daily life. So understanding the value and the importance of that. And I think many of you have achieved that and, and Dave even talked about that in his opening comments, how important it is to understand that historical, political, and cultural, social context in which you're working. When we talk about collaborative, we're really highlighting with whom and how collaboration occurs. And I should tell you, most of the pictures in here are from the D80 photo stream that I could find before I came here. So these are pictures of, of engagement that happened within this program. It's very, very, very telling when you can see pictures like this about the program in which you're engaged. So this is with whom and how collaboration occurs. 
And you hit on that a little bit. You hit on <coughs> who is it we're talking to? Are we collaborating within our design team? Is that are we isolated and just talking amongst ourselves? Are we out in the community talking to the individuals with whom we're really interested in interacting and with whom we're interested in learning, from whom we're interested in learning? So it's really that capacity to work and interact with stakeholders. And one of the quotes that I wanted to share here is, we wanted to start with something very tangible with this community that we would that would be conducive to co-design. That's a really interesting phrase. A student used that co-design, designing in collaboration with somebody, and really working with them. We went back and forth a lot with them about what do you think of this, and then there was a whole series of questions, and that going back and forth really engages you with the community and invests <coughs> you in the outcome. I see nodding hats, so I'm glad a lot of you have had this experience and can relate to this. So, sorry, open to flexibility and ambiguity, helping with unfamiliar situations and remaining open to learning from other cultures. So it's that, that, that um, propensity to engage in the unfamiliar. And so many of you have gone out and done that now, and now you appreciate what that looks like. Um, it's doing it with and, and withholding some judgment as you do that, right? Because so often the things you encounter are not really in alignment with maybe what your cultural expectations might have been with coming into an, a new environment like this. So it's really feeling non-threatened and, and non-judgmental. I put this picture here because we're looking at food. One of the things that I found traveling internationally is that food ends up being one of those really uncomfortable things <laughs> because you get somewhere and you're like, I have no idea what this is. And, and everybody around you is eating it. I actually had a really unusual experience, unexpected experience. I was leading a group of um, actually alumni on a trip in Peru. And we were going to, uh, it was a cultural tour. So it was just a, it was just a vacation, right? And um, we were going to, because it was a cultural tour, we were going to have to share a meal with a family in Peru, which was incredible. And I had some of the adults traveling with us, I mean, like old people, were there and they're even older than me, were actually making themselves physically ill about going to eat in a Peruvian home because they were worried that we were going to be eating guinea pig, which we did. And it was fantastic. But they were so concerned about it that it really inhibited their ability to participate. And that's one of those things is being open to that, that flexibility and ambiguity. And I think you'll see in the quote that I share, there's some, um, another thing that comes up. So one of the hardest parts was realizing that I was looking from my American culture perspective. And it took me a while to think, it's not wrong that they're doing it slow, it's just different. And it's really hard to change that frame of reference, and I know that many of you have done that. And it's, it's, it's really important to recognize that that's an important part of accomplishing the goals you wish to accomplish in this context. So as I was beginning my journey of learning about this, I met a young man who had been in the Peace Corps, and he shared with me this analogy of a river. Have any of you heard the analogy of a river in relationship to working in a community? Oh good, so I get to share something new. <laughs> Everything else you already know, but this is new. So the analogy here is that a community is a river. The people and the things that have been going on there have been going on there long before you arrived, and they're gonna go on long after you leave. And what you do is you enter at a certain point here and you, you adjust the flow potentially, but you're really not, you're not changing this huge picture, right? And understanding where that, that flow comes from and where it's headed is really important in this process. And this analogy really helped me to understand the importance of, of getting into that social and historical context and speaking with the individuals in the community and respecting what it is they have to say and understanding <coughs> what you might be able to do to work in collaboration with them. You also have a great privilege because you are privileged to leave that community. And the individuals that you're working with may not have that privilege. And they need to continue going on and living there. So the effect you have can be truly profound upon them, but you leave. So, so you have to put those things into perspective. So when I was at U of M, I also, um, 
advised a student organization that did work in Guatemala. They were in the Alta Verapaz region um, at a little town called Samos San Lucas. And I started advising this group and they came to me when I sat down with them, when I first started advising them, they said, well, we went there, we made a biosand filter system, and we left it there, and we came home, and the next time we went back, it was in a closet, and it wasn't being used. And they told us it was broken. So we fixed it, and we went home. And we came back, and it was in a closet, not being used. And we came home, and we fixed it. And so this went on for like two years and four trips, going back and forth and fixing this. And nobody ever asked the question, why? Why, why you know, did, nobody even asked them if they wanted a biosand filter to begin with. And so the student organization went through the process of starting to understand that you can't just sweep in and drop something off and hope it works, right? That you have to really work with the community to understand and build a, a sense of mutual understanding and come up with those projects that really make it can, can make a difference from their perspective, not just yours. And so as they were working, what they found is they went back with the idea that we're going to do a little bit of anthropological research. We're going to talk to them about what their community is like and what the history is here and do some, do some actual research on the history of the region. And when they did that, they began to learn that this community was particularly unique in Guatemala. Maybe not unique in Guatemala, but unique from their perspective in that many of the um, individuals in the community came from very different or different villages. And because of the strife that had occurred in Guatemala, they had all been forced out of their villages and into this village together. They had a hard time interacting across those, even those small cultural differences from village to village. But the one thing they could gather around was education. So that was one thing everybody agreed on, that we needed to educate our children. And part of that was providing light so that their children could read at night. And so as they began to develop this, their ideas, they began to understand that the education was a way to work in the community and to learn and to develop with the community something of high value. And so this was, this was one of the results of them working in the community and actually testing the solar lights that they had designed with the community members and leaders. And, and they did this through the school to show the students in the school how to make these and fix them and, and to source the materials locally. And then they also worked with the local candle sellers to understand how they might be able to provide these as an alternative product so that they weren't losing their economic viability. So it was interesting to see that transition in the students and it was interesting to see that kind of this, those first three pieces all fit together in my mind towards that. So the fourth dimension is intentional. This is your intrinsic motivation to engage with a design process and see it through to completion. And this is really closely coupled with an understanding of how you work with your design goals and your stakeholder needs and how this presents an opportunity to learn and develop. And so one of the quotes from here is taking the time to acknowledge your own perspective and limitations of that especially, and to be able to go and spend a significant amount of time in the culture that you're designing with, I like that, designing with, to really see what they value. And so, um, as I was learning about this as well, that same individual who had, had taught me about the river analogy, also taught me about a few other um, things that were really important in this context. And I want to share with you a quote that actually a couple of quotes that really pointed to me the importance of how we frame what it is we're doing. And that's why I asked you to fill out the little card. So Ivan Illich was a philosopher and priest and he was very active in the 60s. And he worked in Mexico and he was, he was encouraging individuals to rethink how they engage in a community. Rather than just coming in and doing service, come in and, and do something different. To really come to understand. So he was delivering a, um, a uh, talk, a, a speech, to a group of students who were about to engage in, a, in Mexico. And what he said is he said to stay home, is basically what he said. He said, I'm here to entreat you to use your money, your status, and your education to travel in Latin America, to come to look and to climb our mountains, which is why I showed this picture, 
and to enjoy our flowers, come to study, but do not come to help. And I see that word show up a lot, that last word, help. Lilia Watson is a, an Aboriginal visual artist and an activist and academic, and she said, if you come to help me, you're wasting your time, but if you come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And so a lot of times when talking to students, especially students who are just beginning this journey, they say, I want to help others. And I think a lot of us reflect that, and that's a very honorable trait. But I think that when we experience and, and when, well, when we talk about this, um, it, it puts it in a context of being better. I can help you because I've got something you don't have. I've got some knowledge, I've got some power, I've got some, you know, some resources that you don't have, and I'm, I'm here to give them to you. And that's, that's a very different dynamic than approaching something from the perspective of learning together, which is really how we described the human-oriented design right at the beginning. It's really working together and understanding. And so I encourage you, even if, even if help is kind of your underlying construct, when you enter a community or when you talk about this kind of work with other people, talk about how you engage in this, how you really engage in it, how it's more than just help, how it's really something bigger than that. And what I do in my classes, I tell our students, let's not use the word help. Let's think of a different way to talk about this. Let's talk about partnership. Let's talk about collaboration. Let's talk about learning. And that, when you do that shift, can really change things. I was talking to a student who came back from... Um, from India, and I was asking her, what did you, what was the most important thing you learned on this trip? Because I think it's good for us to sit back and think about that. And she thought about it, she said, you know, I haven't really had time to process this yet, but one of the things that I learned, one of the really, really like surprising moments, because that's when you learn a lot, right? When you're surprised and shocked, and it's just like, I don't know what this means, and you sit back and think. She said she, that, that her team had walked into a school and they had made some assumptions about what the school knew about them coming. And the school really didn't know that they were coming. And when they walked in, I think that, and I'm fair, paraphrasing this horribly, but you'll get the idea. They went in and said to the, to the headmaster of the school that, well, we're here to help you. And the headmaster's response was, what makes you think we need help? So I think it's really important to think about the words we use when we talk about this, and not just with our community partners, but when we talk about this in the context of, of how we talk about what we do. So the last dimension is being social responsible. So the role that we have as designers in solving and addressing social issues, and I think you're all sitting in this room because you feel that. You already have a really strong sense of social responsibility. And part of this is questioning, though, traditional design approaches and dominant ideologies. And a quote I have from this is, the engineering decisions that are made, the student was talking about all the things that contribute to the engineering decisions, but then also including in that experience, the experiences outside of engineering. And this student had been engaged in a social justice um, organization on campus. Using that experience and perspective in Ghana and then thinking about engineering for social so this is an engineering student who had a variety of experiences across campus and was integrating those into what she was doing in her work. And so socially responsible speaks to that. Um, oh, I think it cut it off, is it? No, nope, there it is, all right. It did cut it off a little bit. So how many of you have heard of this? Emily Pilato? We need to get her to campus. <laughs> So Emily Pulitzin is a designer, and she's founder of Project H Design. And she was trained at, I have to look now, because I can't remember right off the top of my head, trained at Berkeley as an architect, actually. And then she studied at the Art Institute of Chicago. And she was engaged in design of products. And as she got engaged in the design of products and goods, she started to evolve the way she was thinking. And she said, you know, we sat in a, in a conference room and for 20 minutes we argued about what was the best doorknob and she kept thinking there's got to be more here there's got to be more to this that we can contribute to this world and so she started this movement to sort of to, to turn design on its ear and think about how we as designers across any discipline anytime you're engaged in a design process to think more thoughtfully 
about what it is you might do. And I know it's cut off there. Um, I can probably read it over here. No, I can't. It's really tiny. Um, what she says is, if you think design can change the world, it just might. But first, we have to change the way we design. And so this is her, um, her ideas about how we might be able to change design. And I know these are hard to read, and it's not very high quality. This was the best image I could find. But she talks about going beyond doing no harm, listening, learning, and understanding, um, thinking big and having no fear. These are the kinds of things that reflect those five dimensions we just talked about. And I think it's really inspirational to think about what it is that can be achieved with, the, with approaches like this. And so I just wanted to share that piece with you as something that you might be able to go and look up. Um, she wrote a book called Design Revolution, and it has over 100 different designs for social impact that I think you'll find are really compelling and really thoughtful. And um, I have the book if anybody wants to come and see it, but something for you to think about too. As you, um, as you move forward, what's your designer's handshake? How would you characterize the way that you approach these things? So finally, um, moving forward, one thing that we found was really compelling as we were doing this study is that as we were interviewing the students and they were telling us their stories, they were having their aha moments right then. It was changing the way they were perceiving what they had experienced. So we affected the students just by having interviews with them. And so today is a great opportunity for you to reflect on what it is you've engaged in, to hear stories of others, to tell your own story, and to really have that opportunity to, to kind of synthesize this experience and see where it is you fall on this, on this um, spectrum of engagement of culturally contextualized design. So it's great to be here today, and I'm really anxious to hear the stories that you have to share from all the experiences that you've had. So thank you very much. Any questions? Sure, I can take questions. We can have a couple questions maybe uh, while the next speaker comes up. Uh, but into India 2015. opportunity to start a brand new honors college and it's an honors college like no other if you haven't heard too much about it does anybody know much about the honors college I know the Palace Institute students have heard things yeah or are, are part of it actually but um, it's an honors it's an inclusive honors college so it's an honors college where you aren't turned away because you have a GPA of a certain number instead you're welcomed to share your experiences, to engage in the programs in the college, and to show your motivation towards your goals. And so it's a very different kind of college than one might expect. It's all about motivation, and your interest in learning, and your interest in really make, taking advantage of everything that Michigan Tech has to offer. So that's a, I mean, how cool. You know, with the background I have and the interests I have in, in you know, really affecting change in, in whatever way I can. This was a great opportunity for me, so that's why I'm here. And it's a great place. I love it. I wouldn't change, change it for the world. Yeah. I found it interesting and a little amusing you used Ivan Illich as an example. Um, he's really critical of modern technology in many cases. How do you, the generation probably doesn't know about him, but how do you reconcile that and his sort of warning? Uh, to so, yeah, so I think that he is very critical, <laughs> or was, yes. Um, so I think that there's, there's things that we all need to reflect on and think about in the context of what we do. Um, we, can, we can plow ahead, and, and there's a lot of things we can do, but I think it's, and, and I think this is part of what he was saying, but I think we really need to back up and think about what we should do. And for me, that, that's the foundation of, of what I think is important for us to consider as we're designing, especially when we're designing in a, in a situation where we have an incredible power advantage over another individual or another community. And to recognize that, and to recognize that, that we all come with a perspective. 
we, we have a certain culture that has, in, that has influenced the way we look at the world. And sometimes we, we value things very highly that another culture may not. And understanding that, that when, when we enter that culture, we need to enter it more as a guest than as somebody who's there to impose our values. So, I mean, and in a way, I, does that answer your question? It's, it's sort of my, my basic philosophy, and it spoke to me when I read that. It shocked me at first. And then I, then I, but then you have to process those things, right? I, always, whenever you're uncomfortable, or, or surprised, or uncertain, those are great learning opportunities, right? So take advantage of them. Anytime you find yourself in that situation, stop for a minute and think about it. Because if you don't, you're going to miss an opportunity to learn. Well, if you want to learn more about the honors college, you know, come and talk to me.